The skunk sensor is a brand new Minecraft block that is able to detect vibrations in the world. It's a super exciting new redstone component and we're going to see a whole host of new inventions born from it. But the skunk sensor isn't just going to create motion detecting doors. I also think it's going to send big ripples into one of Minecraft's oldest pastimes, map making. Now, the face of map making has changed a lot over the years, but in more recent times, this tradition of creating custom experiences within Minecraft has taken a little bit of a backseat and hasn't been quite as prominent in the Minecraft culture as it once was. But I think with the introduction of Skulk and just 1.17 in general, we're going to see a brand new chapter open up in this space and see the next evolution of Minecraft map making. Today, we're going to go over a little history of where this tradition started, how it grew from humble beginnings into something much more formidable, and how the new Skulk Sensor could very well breathe a new lease of life into the activity as a whole. So hello and welcome, I will be your host, I'm Simply Sark, and could Skulk Sensors resurrect Minecraft map making? Before we get to that, I'd like to mention that today's video has kindly been sponsored by Core, which is interesting because Core shares quite a few similarities with Minecraft map making. Core is a new platform for creating and playing your very own games. Core's aim is basically to make creating games quick, easy, and most importantly, fun. It's got a built-in editor that was designed to be super simple to use, even if you have no idea how to make games. If you've ever fancied making games, Core is a great way to get your foot in the door and start getting familiar with game design. It's built on Unreal Engine, which is an industry standard, so you can start at whatever skill level and build from there as your experience and confidence grows. Core also has a whole ecosystem of games to play and share, which means you can rapidly push out games you've made, but also play one of the many games others in the community are releasing all the time. And you can make any genre, platformer, RPG, scary, horror games, whatever you like. Something exciting going on soon is an invitational game jam where creators, modders, and game devs try to create the best game in Core. There's a prize pool of $120,000 and applications are open until the 28th of February. Core is free, so make sure to check it out with the link in the description below. So to explain what's so exciting about Skulk Sensors for map making, we're going to need to go back in time to understand where map making came from and how it changed over the years. Now, if you're new to this channel, and if you're so new that you don't even know who I am, subscribe, let's get to know each other a little better. Then you might not know that this channel was originally all about map making and concepts. When I started, command blocks didn't exist, and when you spoke about map making, it was basically just talking about survival redstone. They were more or less one in the same, and anything you made in a custom adventure map could nearly entirely be done in survival mode as well. You've probably seen Effie Disco's Temple of Notch, it's super well known, and it's such a classic example of old school Minecraft map making. It didn't use any command blocks, it's just pure unadulterated survival redstone of yesteryear. Minecraft map making, once upon a time, was a really big deal in the community. Everyone played adventure maps, it was the it thing to do on YouTube, and even if you weren't a YouTuber at all, if your maps were good enough, that was enough clout to become known in the community. Vex was never really a YouTuber back in the day, he just made maps, and yet people still knew exactly who he was. Back then, people were celebrated just for being talented Minecrafters. Can the same be said today when the majority of the people you know are YouTubers, streamers, influencers, and entertainers? Not quite so much. Eventually, map makers started wanting more control, and we began to get more powerful features unavailable in survival, either requiring creative mode or external tools like NBT editors. Monster spawners were sort of the precursor to command blocks. You could do some pretty revolutionary stuff with them at the time. If you've never seen this type of minecart, consider yourself lucky. What is now child's play with command blocks was a tedious nightmare with spawners. I remember making this animated boss battle. It looks a little janky now, but trust me, this was super hard to do back then. Command blocks were not only added, but have gone through dozens of iterations over the years. What was initially a fairly straightforward block that could do simplistic tasks like changing your game mode and giving you XP has grown into this behemoth scripting tool that can do basically anything. It's so powerful it decides it doesn't even need its blocky form anymore and can just exist as text in functions. 
This kind of capability is really cool, and it's been fascinating watching the mechanic evolve from when it was introduced to where it is nowadays. But a strange thing has also happened here, because even though Mojang has invested loads of resources into giving mapmakers more and more tools to work with, the output of custom Minecraft maps has actually been on the decline for years. Which makes you scratch your head a little, because surely there should be more now that we can do so much. I think the reason this has happened is quite simple. People originally loved Minecraft map making because it was really easy to get started. You already knew how all the tools and mechanics worked because stuff like redstone was built into the regular game. To make maps was just an extension of playing the game. And though command blocks are a fantastic tool, as they've grown in complexity, so has the chasm between beginner and expert. Using commands in modern Minecraft is now less similar to playing Minecraft and more similar to just plain old coding. There's nothing wrong with having that capability, but without a gentle learning curve like the good old days to ease people into it, a lot of newcomers get a bit alienated when it comes to getting started. So, how exactly do skulk sensors play into the story here? Well, here's why I think they're going to help resurrect map making and rebirth the whole idea into a modern setting. I think the exciting thing with the skulk sensor is that they take some of those higher level abilities you see more of in creative mode and repurpose them back into the survival setting we all know and love because skulk sensors are very powerful. They're basically like a Swiss army knife of detecting things. Take something like a daylight sensor, it detects, well, daylight, and that's it. A pressure plate detects something standing on it, and that's it. But the skulk sensor can detect all kinds of random events and translate that information into redstone signals. It doesn't just have one purpose, it has dozens of them. It's not so much that this block is as good as commands, but it offers some similar capabilities like detecting if a player is walking and does it in a more survival appropriate way. Powerful enough to be useful, but familiar enough to still feel like you're part of the game. What I'd love to see with the skulk sensors is having map making come full circle. It started out in the very homegrown setting that is survival mode, only to spin off into a completely different beast with commands. How funny would it be, after all that, for it to be reincarnated into the very thing from whence it was born? A really great example of this is from my good friend Tango over on the Hermitcraft server. Tango actually made an entire dungeon crawling card collecting minigame all in survival mode. It didn't use skulk sensors, but it's a great example of that classic Minecraft spirit. Could something like that be done flawlessly with command blocks? Absolutely. But people really liked it because of that familiarity of making it in survival mode. You have to interpret the rules a little bit here and there. You know, that stick isn't actually a stick, it's a magic wand or whatever, but that clunky charm is what makes it all great. The weird thing about 1.17 is some of the features really do feel like they were made with mini games and maps in mind. If you take the drip leaf, for instance, in a survival context, it's a little hard to see what practical use it has. But then if you reframe that question with mini games in mind, it becomes super obvious what it could be used for. Parkour, platforming, spleef, you name it. The drip leaf feels like it was primarily designed for map making. You could say a similar thing with powdered snow. If you imagine something like an escape room, the whole powdered snow leather armor mechanic really feels like it'd be in its element there. The skulk sensor is clearly the crown jewel in all this and adds dozens and dozens of new capabilities that we've never had access to in survival before. I actually came up with a really cool concept that I think highlights quite well what kind of maps and minigames you can make in survival mode if you just put your mind to it. I was interested in raid mechanics and learned that the raid boss bar can actually be customised and controlled quite easily. See, the way it works is the raid bar displays the health of the raid members as one single entity, not just how many are left. This is interesting because if you lower the raid members to just one single enemy, that effectively displays just that mob's health on the boss bar. There is a bit of a trick to getting it to work though. Basically, you need to ensure before the rate is started that you already have some kind of illager type in the vicinity. This way, when the raid starts, that single mob is considered the first wave and whatever the health was at the inception of the raid 
will be the maximum steps in the bar. So if a pillager has 20 health when it begins, the full bar has 20 notches. If his health is 5, it has just 5 notches. Or you could use a ravager which has a much higher health ceiling. This basically means you have an on-screen graphic to display information to the player. This can be used in all sorts of fun ways, but you could literally just use it as a custom boss bar. If you take this mechanic and combine it with the Skulk sensor, you can create your very own custom boss fight. One of the Skulk's frequencies detects when a mob is hit, so every time you hit your custom boss mob, this can send a signal and take a health point away from your Illager, which then updates the boss bar in real time. This is just one example, but you can really start to see the kinds of new options Skulk sensors are bringing to the game. That said, on the topic of Skulk sensors, I really do think they have a gigantic flaw to them that might be fixed, but I just wanted to point it out because if it's not, it kind of takes a huge boon away from them. Even though Skulks can differentiate between vibrations, the big issue they have is they only do that after the fact. Say you want to detect the block place frequency, which is 12 at the moment. Well, that's great, but the Skulk sensor only detects one thing at a time. If it picks up the wrong vibration, then it'll stay occupied for two seconds or so, and the vibration you actually wanted to catch slips past unnoticed. This is going to happen a lot because some vibrations, like stepping, are constantly going to be triggering the Skulk sensor. There are two ways you could fix this. Either allow the Skulk to be disengaged prematurely, like if you powered it with redstone, or, a better way, allow vibrations to be filtered out before it reaches the Skulk. Skulk actually kind of already has this built in. Wall blocks will naturally occlude vibrations and prevent Skulk sensors from firing off. What you could do here is use the 15 coloured walls to selectively allow the 15 different frequencies through. For example, red wool might include all vibrations with the exception of frequency level 7. This way, all that interference never even reaches the skulk to begin with. I think it's a fair idea to bundle some of the vibrations together, like how eat and projectile land share a frequency, but I also think unless this issue I'm talking about is fixed in some way, this whole mechanic is largely ineffective. And that's because despite this cool ability to differentiate between vibration sources, the inability to isolate frequencies properly makes it pretty hard to work with in real terms. But beyond all that, I still think this is going to be an interesting period for making maps and custom experiences in Minecraft. It'd be great to see a return to that more down-to-earth idea of what map making originally looked like. It's not so much that there'll be these big, glitzy, complete overhauls of the game, they might just be these small experiences you host on a server with your friends that you integrate into your plain old server world. Nothing too complicated, just simple sandbox Minecraft. It'll definitely be interesting to watch unfold, whatever the case. But let me know what you think about all this. What impact do you reckon Skulk is going to have on the game? And what sort of fun creations do you have planned? Either way, that is all we have time for today. Again, a big thank you to Core for sponsoring today's video. Definitely make sure to check it out in the description below. But guys, I have been your host. I'm Sophie Sock, and I'll catch you in the next one.